and welcome to Talking Technophobia. Uh, great Scott, I'm Professor Movies, and tonight we will be talking about uh, Robert Zemeckis' uh, trilogy of films, uh, Back to the Future, parts one, two, and three. Uh, I thank you all for coming. I thank you for watching at home or on the internet or in your car while you're driving, which you shouldn't be doing. Uh, Unless you're driving your DeLorean uh, on your way back from 2015, which technically is the past now. Everything in Back to the Future is the past. Um, so let's, let's jump right into it. Um, show of hands, who watched all three of the movies? Just so I know where we are with us. OK, all right, fair. I appreciate your honesty, the rest of you. Um, I reluctantly also watched all three of the movies. Uh, the first one was no problem. I enjoy coming back to it time and time again. It's one of those movies I could watch like endlessly. The second one I like because of how reminiscent of the first one it is. Uh, and then like we finished the second movie and uh, Mrs. Professor Movies asked me, she said, uh, like, can we not watch the third? And I was like, okay. And like we got really close to today, and like two days ago, I was like, I need to watch the third one. Like I, I can't not watch the third one, because like I was hoping like something at the end I would see it would remind me of something. But for those of you who just watched the first or maybe the first two, that's okay. I am going to include clips from probably all three. I'm going to invite you to speak about all three if you want. Um, and what some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to start with uh, some ideas about technology. Maybe we're going to move into time travel. Uh, I have a conversation with a friend of mine often about whether or not time travel is possible. Uh, I do not think you can go backwards in time, but I mean, you guys can convince me. I think we can go forwards in time. I think, in fact, we are constantly going forwards in time. But we'll, we might get into that a little later. Um, talk about the mad scientist, revisit that. Um, I've decided that maybe this is going to be my Professor Movies uniform moving forward. I kind of like this. It feels right. Uh, but we are gonna, we're going to talk about uh, Mad Scientist, specifically with Doc Brown, um, and think about how these ideas have changed since like Frankenstein, since what we saw in uh, Godzilla or Independence Day, things like that. Um, and then like we'll move into human ingenuity, because I think there's a lot of that in this movie. Uh, for everything that goes wrong, like uh, our human characters can come up with a solution. And then I really want to talk about nostalgia, because this movie is not only a nostalgic film for us viewing it now, but it was a movie all about nostalgia. And with the second one, it's really like projecting and trying to create future nostalgia. Um, and like the nostalgia cycle is this real thing that's worth like uh, talking about if we can. Um, this fact that like we long for the past. Um, but ultimately, all in all, we're trying to talk about what this, these films are saying in terms of like uh, what it's showing us about our own culture, either at the time when these films were produced or now, what it's saying about technology then or now, and ultimately like how it changed movies, right? Because Back to the Future changed movies. Okay. So with that, that said, uh, this is me. Uh, this was the really sweet Doc Brown costume I ordered from Amazon uh, at the beginning of December. And um, it's, it says it's going to arrive Monday. In fact, it's, it told me it was going to arrive by today when I checked it. And I went home, and it wasn't there. So I'm going to, I don't know, make some kind of joke about time travel. But you didn't like it, so <laughs> it's, it's OK. But like, just imagine that like, had I been able to time travel, I would be wearing that. OK, so general information for all of us about the films. I'm going to focus primarily on the first one for some of this background stuff. But uh, written and directed by Robert Zemeckis. Uh, I want to say this is his first directorial project, but I could be wrong with that. I don't know if Romancing the Stone he was the director of or not, or just the writer. But this is a film series that is produced by Spielberg, right? And it was very difficult to get studios interested in, in trying to sell the film at the time. Uh, first film comes out in 85, four years go by, and the next two parts are filmed together and released together. Part two comes out in 89, and part three comes out in 90. The end of part two has like a trailer for part three at the end of the movie. Um, and part three starts with a, like a previously on Back to the Future. Um, Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd, uh, who's Biff? Uh, Thomas F. Wilson, Leah Thompson. I did not include Crips, uh, Crispin Glover for legal reasons, if you're familiar with that at all. Crispin Glover plays George McFly in the first movie and only the first movie. 
and there was a big legal dispute about them using his like, like likeness uh, for the other movies. And if you see the end of the third movie, you see a guy uh, trying to look like Crispin Glover, and that's why he stays like in the background of the door at the end, and he's like, where are my glasses? Because like it's not really Crispin Glover. Movie had a modest budget, went on to make a lot of money, um, and in terms of like its effect on our own culture, right? Back to the Future, these three movies produced. Uh, a television show, like this animated series, theme park rides, uh, and there is currently in production a musical version of this on Broadway's what? West End. Uh, so oh, look West forward End. to like in two years, like maybe it, it coming over the pond to us. <laughs> but I'd be interested in seeing a Back to the Future <laughs> musical. Um, I can only imagine how ridiculous that would be, but I, I, I think good things about it. Exactly. Big influence on skateboard culture. Um, <laughs> not only hoverboards, right, but this comes out at, at the, like, the dawning of the skateboard like, revolution culturally and like, does a lot for making it cool amongst the young kids. Um, and ultimately, uh, really much about pop culture and uh, has influenced pop culture as a result. Um, the first movie, they really kind of like say good things about DeLoreans, and in the second movie, not so much. So I wonder if they had kept being positive about DeLoreans, if they could have maybe saved that, that car. But I don't know. Because I would say that's the only reason anyone remembers the DeLorean now. All right, so let's get started. With that said, let's take a look at the end of this uh, series, because I really think it's the end of the series where they try to really like crystallize a, some kind of point with it all. Um, and we'll talk about, hopefully at some point, how like some of the other movies kind of undo some of the messages from the first movie. They give Marty this arc about being a chicken in the second two movies that really isn't there in the first. But I like the message that comes in the end of the third. I'm not sure if it's earned, but <coughs> here's the end of the movie. And for background extra points, I guess pay attention to Vern, uh, because he does some weird stuff in the background. All right, so I'm going to play a clip. So I, I show you that because like, it gives us this nice message about like, uh, our own like, power in determining <laughs> like, the, the course of our lives right? with that idea of like, the future is whatever you make it. Um, it gives you uh, a view of where the technology ends up in this film franchise. I had the thought, uh, and maybe we'll get into this when we talk about technology, right? but like, I was like, oh man, is like, this about an, a, alternative energy sources? Because the like DeLorean runs on plutonium, and then he gets the Mr. Fusion, and then like they build in the second one that transistor thing using the 1950 parts with tubes, and then by the third one, like it's no gasoline, so we gotta, we gotta find an alternate source, and they use steam. And this thing's flying by the end, so I don't know. Maybe on some level, right, you could look at the way the DeLorean's energy sources have changed, and maybe it's like making an argument for like being less dependent on gasoline, but this is literally a thought I had last night trying to fall asleep. Um, with that said, like, the best yeah, no, you're right. Uh, that and on the toilet, the best ideas happen. With that said, um, I have been uh, informed that Talking Technophobia has gone international, and we have viewers from Italy, so hello, Stefan. Hey! Uh, thanks for watching. Um, <laughs> With that said, uh, so one of the things that I think is really important in Back to the Future in connection to technology is the, the past, right? Uh, the view and how we view it. So like, as technology increases and the future becomes more uncertain, there's a good chunk of people who are tempted to look back at the past, right? And often we look back at the past fondly. And there is something really dangerous about this kind of uninformed nostalgia, right? The selective memory of the past and how it was and how it was so much better than it is today. Um, and like, if you make that mistake, right, it can have irreparable consequences like on the present and the future. So to me, right, Back to the Future is really a movie about, no, 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 let's go back and see what it really was. Let's dispel all of the the misconceptions that come with like uh, that dangerous nostalgia, and let's try to learn something from it and make changes based on it. Um, uh, so really for me, right, it's the dangers in that idealized version of the past, and I think it's like in order to prepare for the future, people need to really come to terms with the realities of the past, right, and not just kind of remember it fondly with rose-colored glasses. 
So with that said, let's look at some technology. And I think most of what I'm going to show you in terms of technology is coming from the second movie because of its predictive aspect of the technology. But feel free with our conversation to talk about like the technology of the, the 50s and how it changed when we get to the 80s, right? Like, or uh, like the use of special effects in these movies, I think, is also something to really think about. Because one of the things they said in the production of making these movies was like they tried to use every trick in the book. <coughs> And there's a lot of effects that like Zemeckis isn't like even 100% happy with, but like it was production time and the best they could do. Okay, so uh, this is uh, this is a film that comes out at a time when CGI is in its infancy, right? Like there's a lot of different kinds of like technology being used in the production of the film, and yet the subject matter of the movie is in itself very much interested in like technology, where it's been and where it could be going. So like, th we can talk about like technology in or outside the movie, things you see, things you notice, things that came true, things that haven't. I'll give. I'll, I'll let you talk about hoverboards for two minutes, maybe. I know. I'm sorry that they're not more. You know, I'm sorry you don't have your hoverboard. But uh, so, what are we thinking, right? What is this movie showing us in terms of technology? How's it using technology? What do you guys see? Well, you can see that um, mm -hmm. the not quite the video phone yeah. to that degree, but we kind of have that now. Yeah, um, with like, like with Zoom video. Yeah. You can do like conference calls. Yeah, um, Google Hangout is like that too. FaceTime. I feel like we're giving these all, all these companies plugs right now. Also, That's okay. You're a, welcome. There's a new TV that yeah. um, you can now face call on. Really? Okay. So yeah, it's like a new smart oh, yeah, TV the, that they're trying the to sell. You can face call on it. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, what do you think? I do think in a few ways it's less actually predictive of the future and yeah. more just the 80s on steroids. Yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, you know, like, a lot of the technologies are just something from the 80s, but shinier. Yeah. And like... Um, so like they miss a lot of the, the bigger revolutions like networking. It's, mm -hmm. still cellular, it's still a phone connection that you used to talk right. about. But it's still a fax. Yeah, it's still the fax, and the fax is a good example. You three of them in your house instead of one in the office. Right, okay. Yeah, it's cool. And even if you think about like their wardrobe, it's just kind of like 80s on steroids. Like, yeah. Go ahead. But I think, <laughs> Two I think the, the access to information mm -hmm. was right on. Even yeah. though we might not see it on a screen now, okay. but you're able to find out anything about anybody. Yeah, with like social media and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, the likes and like avid basketball fan and likes beer and this thing and that thing when Needles is on the screen. Like that's pretty much information that we have collected and uh, like delivered to the rest of the world about ourselves. You know, if you think about your profiles and all of that. That's right. You can find out a lot about me on the internet, I'm sure. <laughs> it got to the point where it's like there's no point trying to make this stuff go away. So it's just like you embrace it. It's like, yeah. That's me in a, a bow tie and a Chippendales outfit, jumping out of a cake. I know. It was is high school. They were, they were weird times. Yeah, go ahead. Is it, when was the microwave invented? Microwave comes out in what, like the 50s? 50s. Who knows? Oh. The original. The original? The, the, the radar range. Yeah. <laughs> so when did it become popular? Because that reminds me of the whole idea of it yeah. is like a Early. microwave. Mm -hmm. Not so much a, a food hydrator, but a microwave where the mom or whoever would put mm -hmm. the food in the microwave and then serve it to the family. Yeah, it's that, like, it's things are just getting faster and faster in terms of, like, food preparation. It's a machine that's doing the cooking. I was thinking about that, and it's like, it's like how is the microwave safe? And like, I know, I'm sure it must be, right? But I'm just like... And then I was thinking like cell phones and everything. It's like all of these, these things are frequencies and energies going out. And like, mm -hmm. I was like, that's got to, like Bluetooth. Doesn't it like go through you? Does it go around you? Like, how does that stuff it's work? It's like the force. It's, okay. it's like the force. It surrounds you. <laughs> um, yeah, no. And I just like, again, and it was watching Back to the Future and thinking about microwaves with the food hydrator where I'm like, how is this stuff good for any of us? Uh, but Doctor well, maybe it isn't. Smoke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and then you're like, oh, everybody's got cancer. And it's like, oh, maybe it's nope. the, the things yes. we're holding up against our heads or how we're cooking our food. I mean, we're here for a good time, not a long time. So. Oh, that's true. Make the most of what you got because yeah. like, it's, it's, you only get one go around. A good we must do leave not a good-looking corpse thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. Burn out, not fade away. And we also These are all uplifting messages. 
Yeah. We also, uh -huh. um, now there's yeah, hologram deep. shows. Yeah. You know, with deceased um, singers. Yeah. Like, Oh, yeah, the Roy Orbison yes. or the Maria Callas thing. Mm -hmm. They had that Tupac hologram like five years ago. They're using that deep fake technology to put people's faces on. Like, if this movie was made now, right, they wouldn't do the prosthetic makeup for the older characters. They would just digitally make them old. And, like, yeah, there's a lot of that that's, that's coming true. Yeah. I think Tarkin would have a, a couple words about this. Uh, yeah, and, they, and they're saying that he would be fine with it, they think. And I, it opens up a... A scary, it opens up scary possibilities where it's like that you're selling your likeness. No, it just creates likeness. special contracts now. It, that too. <laughs> um, the lawyers okay. haven't caught up yet. Other thoughts with this? There was an interesting yeah. part with the uh, son with the glasses on, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just being completely removed from the familial gathering place. You yeah. Know, and being in his own world, not there present with everyone. Yeah, that's really good, right? And it reminds me of like when we think about like Google Glass. There was a couple years ago they were pushing that mm -hmm. and then everyone was banning Google Glass because it was like invasions of other people's privacy and stuff. Now you could be recording. Yeah. Contacts. Now they're trying to make yeah. con like contacts? Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, when I lived in New York City and I would ride the subway, I would think about like how these like the screens are just getting closer and closer to our face, right? You you sit in the movie theater, and then if the screen came into your house, right? Now it's there in that room with you, and then it was on the computer in front of you, and then it was on your phone, right? And now it's Google Glass, and then even contacts. It's just like getting closer and closer. Um, and I often think of like blinders on a horse when it gets that close mm -hmm. to us. Yep. Um, I'm just hearing James Bond theme. Da -da, da -da, da -da. Yeah, no, that'll be good. You'll only see what we want to see. And then eventually it's going to be, instead of seeing stuff, it's just going to be inputted directly into our brain. Right, yeah, you just like plug right in, it'll beam the show right into your brain. For good or bad, right? Who knows? That could be really appealing. Yeah. I, think, I think that um, the f bringing the, f the food is in the house yeah. is kind of where we're headed now. Okay. Because people have food delivered to their house. Yeah. And at a, you know, long, you know, we never did that. We we went out and we chopped mm -hmm. food or you grew it in your backyard or whatever, but everything is contained in the house now. There's yeah. like almost no reason to go outside. And I think that's kind of a mirror of what's happening now. Yeah. You know, the, the mom's not in the kitchen cooking. Mom's you not know, even home. Yeah. It, it's delivered. Mm hmm. So. No, that's true. Yeah, the, it's a Pizza Hut little like tinfoil yes. thing that she heats up or hydrates. Hydrate. Also, think about how that house, if the power went out, becomes an inescapable like jail cell for you, right? <laughs> yeah, there are yeah, no yeah. knobs <laughs> on the doors. Yep. Like it's all technological, electro-biometric interface, and like all you need is like that power grid to go down, and you Forget can't it. get out now. <laughs> but then people don't know how to do anything either. Right. If you are not cooking or doing things for yourself, mm -hmm. then when everything's gone, then what do you do? That's right, yeah, right? Like the idea that like technology is, is making life easier for us by taking away a lot of that time-consuming tasks is great until you don't have that technology and now you don't know how to do it. Like everyone who knows how to follow GPS on their phone but can't read a map. Mm. Right, like and navigate using the map without the computer actually drawing the line for you, like is a is like a frightening possibility if all of a sudden your GPS doesn't work, right? <laughs> or you're somewhere where there's no internet. Yeah, <gasps> definitely that could uh, you know God forbid, right? Like there's no internet where you are, but like then what do you do? Right, well, you can't stream that, your Netflix. Doesn't that create a lot of stress? I think so. Yeah. Because then if everything goes out, then you don't know what to do or you can't mm -hmm. problem solve because right. the technology is always solving problems for you. That's true. And like the technology in this movie is not perfect by any means. It's very like uh, glitchy and problematic, right? The DeLorean breaks like twice in each movie, I want to <laughs> say, like at least. Yeah, um, and it's about, shadowing. right? It's about them like needing to like troubleshoot whatever problem the car or vehicle has run into. You know, um, so it's very much about like people needing to adapt to like uh, malfunctioning technology, uh, damaged technology. Because yeah, in the third one, it's like, it needs gasoline. And the first gas station's not coming in for another 150 years. <laughs> and it's like, oh no. Yeah, and like it's thinking about alternative solutions for that. Okay, uh, anything else in terms of technology? 
Uh, again, you don't have to just talk about that scene. You can talk about anything. You can talk about, like, this made me like DeLoreans. I really think Back to the Future is a car movie, like in the same way Fast and the Furious is a car movie. <laughs> like on some level, this is a movie that gets like young people, but maybe not just young people, like excited about cars. Um, the DeLorean looks cool. It's very like sleek and 80s, and like it looks like an electric razor. It also looks like, like the razor f cell phone they used to have. Yep. Um, the best so I, phone according to my dad. Yeah, there may, there, a new one's coming out. <laughs> I saw a commercial for yeah, it. I'm sure I'll see another commercial because I just said it out loud. So I'm sure <laughs> YouTube or something will play that for me. Yeah. Uh, anything else in terms of technology? That you need a scientist. Like, how would, he, how have they, how would they have solved all these problems mm -hmm. if one of them wasn't a scientist? Yeah. They would have been in trouble. Yeah, they exactly. wouldn't have been in trouble in the first place if it wasn't for the scientists. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And like, there was a conscious decision to change his the, the Doc Brown's character name from Professor Brown in earlier drafts to Doc Brown. And like, I'm, I walk away from like the movie and also knowing that bit of knowledge and be like, is he a real scientist though? Like, or is he like in the sense that like he has like degrees? Like, I don't know. Because I don't know if it's like Professor Emmett Brown, PhD, or he's like a dude who likes science, is interested in learning it, monkeys around with it, and like Doc is his nickname, like Danny Torrance Doc is his nickname. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm not sure. I don't know what you guys think. I think you watch some YouTube videos in the future and came back. Yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> it's like uh, the how-to kind of thing, yeah. He's an engineer. He's an applied scientist. Okay, a, a yeah. Tinkerer. Okay, yeah, like a tinkerer, and uh, like he surrounds the movie opens with the like, and it's in all three movies, right? He's got those three photographs of scientists, of tinkerers, of uh, like jack of all trades, second time, uh, with um, in terms of science, right? He's got Einstein, he's got um, oh, now I'm blanking on all the others. I know Einstein was the last name. Newton, Copernicus, Newton, Copernicus and the guy who stole everything from everyone. <laughs> yeah. As in Quentin Tarantino? Yes. <laughs> yes. But he was either dressed as Benjamin Franklin or. I think Benjamin Franklin. Who's the guy who. With Tesla? Not Tesla. Yeah, with Tesla, the other guy. Yeah. The Edison. I think it's Edison. I think. Yeah, Edison. Yeah, no, yeah. But I think the one of the photos is Edison. If it's not Edison, it's Ben Franklin. I don't know. Um, insert correct photo of things here. One day I'll edit this footage and I'll, and that's a note to myself in the future. Um, the thing yes. is, in all three movies, you have some sort of a Rube Goldberg type device. Yeah. Like in the first movie, he's got this whole thing to feed the dog. Yeah. And of course, the dog's not there, so you've got this huge pile of dog food on the floor. Yeah, and the and the bowl like Einstein's yeah. name yeah. on it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the, and that automation. Third, yeah, and in the third movie, he's got that whole thing going, you know, in the barn. Yeah, to make what? Does anyone remember? It makes one ice cube. Yeah. Like, it's this giant contraption, <laughs> and, he's, and Marty's like, it's a refrigerator. Yeah. So, like, yeah, and it produces, like, one ice cube, and he's like, iced tea? Yep. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, like, if you think about how, like, yeah, the first, like, computers were, like, the size of this building, right? And, yeah. like, the technology just gets smaller and smaller, faster and faster, right? And, like, it's set up with that, uh, the, 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 the ice paper. maker, yeah. you know, being gigantic. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot with it that I think is worth thinking about. I think it's also a warning about like our over-dependence on technology, kind of as we're saying. It's also uh, giving like implications that like um, maybe it's headed in a wrong direction. Maybe we're sacrificing some of our own skills. Maybe it's making us less instead of allowing us to do more. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, all right, but flying cars, I think one day maybe. We've got electric cars now. That's like a step in that direction. No Mr. Fusions yet or hydrators, but we're getting there. Which is a pity because it yeah. would really solve a lot of our waste problems. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, but perhaps it does kind of set up like the importance of recycling, right? Like yeah. being a statement being made in 85 versus like yeah. how much recycling has become a part of like society today. Yeah. Like, with an eye towards that, you know? Like, it's possible. Um, okay. All right. So let's talk about time travel. Um, yeah, I don't know. The whole, like, I was like, every scene with Doc and Marty is a scene about time travel. But So I tried to pull out a scene from the second one. Oh, and then I think I also show you the opening scene from the first one. I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, the first one. Yeah. 
So I really like uh, like time travel because of how like puzzling and paradoxical it really is, right? Like uh, there's lots of things, film, television, video games, right, in media that like fall into the the genre of like time travel, uh, and a lot of them aren't good because of how difficult it is to write a good story about time travel because of how like problematic time travel is. So uh, my belief is that time, right, is a measurement. And it's, it's largely like a man-made measurement. And minutes and seconds, mm -hmm. these are things we've came up with, right? But time actually does exist because like our cells divide and all of that stuff, right? Like, you know, and you experience time maybe differently in your dreams, right? When you sleep, like you had that stream, it felt like you were weeks. Uh, it was going on for weeks and it was like five minutes, right? That kind of thing. Time might be a relative uh, construct in that terms. But I really think time is a ray, meaning there's like a fixed starting point. It's a measurement of light and rays extend in one direction infinitely. So I believe that you could remove yourself from a timeline, cryogenic freezing, Stargate, something, right? Uh, and go to the future, right? Because time is always going to be extending, right? But, uh, and there's always going to be more, right, down there. Uh, but I don't think you can go backwards. So convince me. Uh, or not, but that's something I want to share with you just to give my own kind of like bias about time travel. Uh, I don't think backwards time travel works because of kind of what Doc Brown is bringing up in that scene <clears throat> with the whole tangent reality. Would there be two Docs and Martys in that, in that world, that alternate 1985, right? Is there a Marty in boarding school and a Doc in the asylum at the same time those guys are having that conversation, or did they replace them when they went back to that time? Right? These are questions I have when I think of it. So let's talk about time travel. Uh, yeah. So compared to like more modern, like dark and gritty time mm -hmm. travel, it's almost like refreshing and like how irreverent it is about time yeah. travel. It doesn't care. It, it tells the story. Yeah. It doesn't ask like, why are you still holding this piece of paper if you never printed out of your fire? Right. It just fades away. So it just goes away. Yeah. Of course it went away. Yeah. And Doc is really ultimately cavalier with the whole time travel stuff, right? Despite yeah. what he says. He's very quick to then be like, nah, 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 never mind. We can't take her with us, Marty. All right, come with me. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, uh, like, it's he's... It's not really a, a movie yeah, about time travel. It's a movie about how people interact when placed in different situations. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I like that. That's good. Yeah. Other thoughts? Or you want to agree or disagree? Yes, sir. This is completely unrelated, but how does Marty's pants not catch on fire in the one right under the blue box? Uh, jeans were made, those are Janko jeans, so they were made of a really uh, durable fiber. These are, in fact, Janko jeans, and you would not be able to set me on fire if you tried. Let's not try, but... Okay. Uh, the the uh, real answer is it's, he's, it's not really there with the fire. It's a computer-generated effect, know. right? And you, you, when you watch it on a big screen, you, like there, you see that it's, like, it's some green screening that's happening. Um, but that's a good catch. That's a good catch with it. I never know. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed it watching it this time. Go ahead. Me too. Yeah. Well, when you do the alternate timelines like mm -hmm. that, you really are, unfortunately, have to understand that time and everything surrounding each of us is mm -hmm. a perception. Okay. So it isn't that there are other timelines because I'm not in there to perceive it. Sure. So if I'm here, this is... This is the boat I'm in. Right, yeah. Right? And at that point, is there another boat? Yes, but right. I've got to go from this boat to that boat. Mm -hmm. So can you go backwards? Only into the one that you've already perceived. Okay, and okay. We call that memory, but that's okay. But I think of it that way, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb. So, go out on the um, limb. I don't believe there's time. I believe that's a human construct. Okay. Yeah. To keep, <clears throat> to keep, <laughs> to keep time. Um, I also think that the past is usually present. Okay. Um, it, even in a philosophical way, because um, a lot of issues that we deal with seem to keep repeating mm -hmm. and repeating mm -hmm. and repeating. Yeah. So. Um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> so, uh, I know, it's, it's kind of sad. Um, but, <laughs> but we do age. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. 
But, you know, when we're not in this body, how do we know what happened? You know, we don't even know what death is. Because really, mm-hmm. we're not dead. That's are true. We? So we don't even know what that is. So we consider this life part of, yeah, I mean, not part, the end of time for us. Mm-hmm. But we don't even know what this body, life, whatever we're, we're doing here. Mm-hmm. We don't know if there's a beginning or end to any of it. Because yeah. we don't know. No, so, that's a good point. So I don't know. I don't know what my point is with that. But um, um, this is my favorite movie. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, Someone, and uh, I'm going to do a bad job of remembering people's names tonight, but someone like articulated the idea that like if you could perceive time four-dimensionally, meaning like because we see things in three dimensions, but if you could see things with that fourth dimension of time, like there would be a line of you. Right. It would be like you five seconds ago, you uh, a minute ago, right. you there, and like you five seconds from now, you a minute from now, and it would just be this like, like worm of you almost moving about the world. Um, what? Did that. Okay, maybe maybe that's where I'm getting it from. Cause like a little bit, I'm thinking of Interstellar with that like the end of Interstellar and how he ends up behind the bookcase and like it's all those moments of the daughter's life. Uh, a little bit, I'm thinking of Donnie Darko uh, with that thing that comes out of them. But yeah, this idea of like uh, time is like how we perceive it, um, and it's really a perspective-based thing and maybe not a universal construct. Um, which sounds better because it sounds like we can't break it if it's just an individual thing. It's much scarier if it's this like objective truth that can be broken, right? And I think that gets like a little dark there. Yes, sir. Also, this is kind of related. Kind of related is related enough. It's like a story about how like there's this world that's in two dimensions and like everybody's like these different shapes. Like there's a square, mm-hmm. and then one day this sphere from the third dimension comes. And okay. And is like, look at me, and like, it changes like the the plane he's on, so that the square sees him like what, like his bottom, and then his middle, and then his top, mm-hmm. sort of. And then he takes the square and shows him everything in t- three dimensions. And so the square is like, whoa! Now show me like the fourth dimension and the fifth dimension. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and the sphere is like, yeah, there's no such thing. Okay. <laughs> but like, if you had asked the square earlier if there was a third dimension. Then he would have said there was no such thing. So. No, that's so. good. Yeah, and it's yeah. um, it's allegory of the cave. It's Plato, right? Like yeah. you think you understand things until you you get outside of that cave and like can see the truth, right? And then it's it opens the way like the world was flat until it wasn't, right? The world was the center of the universe until it wasn't. Everybody knew of knew these things to be true mm-hmm. until we learned something else and we're able to yeah. look at the world differently. Okay. That's, yeah. the, that's the line from Men in Black, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, it's, it's in that same scene where they're on the park bench, yeah. and he's like, you know, a person is smart. People are stupid. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. And the end, you know. That line from Blazing Saddles. Which one? The common clay. The oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> morons. Morons. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe, you know, <laughs> and like, nothing against those morons. I'm sure they're great. Yes. You know, I was just thinking, um, how the film is conscious about what they do and how it affects other people. Mm -hmm. But um, we don't, sometimes we don't even think about that in our regular life Mm -hmm. when we can affect some kind of change or what we do affects other people. Yeah. Like if you, you step outside the metaphor of like time travel and stuff like that and you just look at like the characterization and cause and effect, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it is very much sending some kind of message about like what you do affects the people around you for good or for bad. Well, like that one yeah. in the beginning of the first movie when, you know, the, the father is kind of wishy-washy and mm-hmm. the mother is kind of let herself go. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that same movie, how they've got an entire, because uh, he stood up for himself, Mm -hmm. they have an entirely different future. Right. Because originally it's like a Florence Nightingale thing where she, like, loves him because she felt bad for him. Yeah. And in the revised timeline of the end of the first movie, it's that she respects him. She, She, like, this is a dude who saved her. It's, it's the opposite of what it was. And like, yeah, it makes all the difference. And I would, I mean, we could talk about like how he gets to that point if you want, you know. Um, but yeah, it's important to keep in mind. 
Other thoughts? Other ideas? Well, I thought it was creepy yeah. about him and his mother. Yeah, I got a picture of that coming up. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, was please. Just, I was weird. trying to... It doesn't make it any more. And it doesn't it's get less just, awkward the more I watch it. Yeah. I know. It's, it's just... just the older you get when you watch it, the more you realize just... To... That's true. No. And maybe that's the point. <laughs> Disney did not want to distribute this movie because of that. Because they're like, there's too much uh, soft incest. We don't, we don't want to go near it. Other studios were saying it wasn't like edgy enough, right? Yeah. But like oh that Disney God. was like, uh, yeah, no. Let's. It was pre Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones made incest a lot more acceptable, and now that is on record. <laughs> I'm glad you were all here with me for that. Good. Uh, so this wasn't their idea of when you wish upon a star. Maybe. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's awkward, that scene uh, with young Lorraine. But also the idea that like Marty has that mention of, like, my mom never did any of this. My mom was like a nun. And then he goes back and sees her, and she's like a normal teenager, just like he's seeing in the 80s. And that, like, again, might tie in with the nostalgia stuff and how we, like, we want to idealize the past. Uh, but maybe. Well, also there's a scene in the yeah. beginning where, you know, she was upset that you know Jennifer was calling him. Mm -hmm. You know, in my day, girls yeah. never called boys. So, this was the narrative she'd spun for her yeah. kids. So yeah. That's why he believed it. Mm -hmm. the Whereas they're playing grab ass different. at the end of the movie. Yeah. Right? He's like grabbing her butt. You know. The, yeah. Well, that Kristen was the Glover. father. Yeah, the father. Yeah, no, no, not yeah, Marty. He, right. yeah. he definitely was not into it. I mean, you could tell he was creeped out from yeah. the beginning just by looking at his face. He's like, well, mm -hmm. oh, nope. <laughs> but mom, you're so thin. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, I think children forget that, that their, their parents, parents are human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, they've gone through, you know, being brainless as a teenager mm -hmm. as well. And so... Sometimes they're trying to save you from yourself, and yeah. so you have to create this persona. Mm -hmm. You don't. You want. You don't want to tell your kids you were hanging out at night. Well, you sure. Know, Why can't I? You right. Know, you you were doing do this. It. So. Yeah, I try to like. But I'm like, I tell my students, I'm like, you know, they want you to have a, a better life than they did. They don't want you to make the same mistakes as you were saying. I think the reality is sometimes though, like people need to learn the lessons that come from making those mistakes. Um, and we can't necessarily like protect children from that thing. But uh, that perspective, right, is, is important. It goes a long way. It totally changes how Marty views his parents by being able to go back and see what they were like. And I believe one of the starting places for like the idea of the script was like the guy was like, would I be friends with my dad in high school, right? And like that was like one of the inception points, you know? Uh, all right, anything else about time travel? Yes. One last thing. You haven't, no one's convinced me we there, can go backwards, there, there by the wasn't, way. There, go weren't, ahead. there weren't too many black people. Except yeah. Except for Entertainer. Yeah. The guy at the counter. Uh huh. Or. Who becomes the mayor in 85. Yes. But yes. But there was only, he was the only one. So, a like, couple things, and maybe this will tie in with nostalgia, right? But it seems like Marty McFly steals rock and roll from black people. It seems <laughs> oh like Marty God. McFly gives the guy who works in the diner the idea to run for mayor. Right, so like it, it, anyway, it's almost it. like a uh, like a co-opting of culture happening in this movie. It was a violation of the prime directive. Yeah, it was it was kind of <laughs> that. And like, cause like well, we're gonna look at Johnny B. Good before this is over, but like, hey Chuck, uh, you gotta hear this. Like this guy's got and it's and like that's Chuck Berry's song and like uh, Chuck Berry created that and like the movie's like no nah, no he got the idea from this guy. Uh, who really, but then heard the Chuck Berry song and just went back in time and played it before Chuck Berry. So I don't know. It's problematic. Trust me, that was not. It's that, just a movie. That was not. That scene wasn't lost on black people. No, I'm sure it was. Because I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Because like I would, about? I find it like kind of like culturally uh, like insulting, like along those lines, where it's like, well, a lot of all the things that like not all the things, right? But a lot of these cultural achievements are kind of being like taken away by this white person a little bit. But well, yeah. that's uh, well, a lot of um, yeah. a lot of rock stars, uh -huh. you know, they went to blues players and listened to them play yeah. and and learned the licks. Uh -huh. So it's not. Uh, 
it didn't happen that way. Yeah, you got people like Chuck Berry, Professor Longhair. You got uh, what's his face at uh, whatever the guy who first was uh, who was uh, producing Elvis, who was like, if I can find a white guy who can sing like a black guy, I'll make a million dollars. Whatever at Sun Records, I think it was. Oh, I forgot his Colonel name. Parker. Yeah, um, yeah, Colonel Parker, and I can never remember his real name. That's what always trips me up. Uh, I'll look it up later. Google will tell me. But like it was that idea where it was like you had like it was race records right before it was rock and roll right and like it was the it, like Eminem and black and like rap music right in the '90s Vanilla Ice before him like you see that happening with culture right you see that happening with music and those examples and like it strikes me as that when I see that Johnny B Good scene uh, because yeah now the only problem is God. this this was this specifically for music. This was brought out at an Arlo Guthrie concert. It's the folk process. It's, it's, it's referred to as when Pete steals Arlo's music. It's yeah. the folk process. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I mean, because Pete Seeger is, you uh -huh. know, I mean, ob obviously the folk god. Mm -hmm. That's so, I mean, you know, so he's allowed, he's allowed the folk process. We can mm -hmm. steal whatever you like, and the original writer gets to go. Uh, royal Wait a royalties? Hello? 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 Mm -hmm. Royalties? <laughs> And there's a lot of that in the music industry, right? It's happened like throughout the ages. People like stealing, sampling, you know, other people's work. It's more than just like we stand on the shoulders of giants, perhaps. But that's that's what we call it, yes. Yeah. yeah. Other, <laughs> the other, folk otherwise, I, 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 rem, I remind you that one line from Amadeus: "There are just too many notes, Mozart." <laughs> <laughs> it's not standing on their shoulders; it's standing on their face. Standing on their face. <laughs> nice. I like that. Like that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I like that. That's good. An improvement From has been made. Future. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? There's hope. There's hope. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not convinced that you can travel back in time. So if anyone had that goal in their mind, you failed. Uh, but there's, there's still hope that I will be convinced one day. Um, all right. So but that would be tomorrow. Oh, I would. I would. I would. I think I'd be okay with time travel because I'm not a woman and I wouldn't be burned as a witch. Uh, because <laughs> women time travelers, pretty much most of history would, would burn them as a witch. Oh, yeah. uh, and it's, you know, so I think I'd be okay. Uh, I would do like what Doc Brown did and I would just like open up a shop. But I think I'd like to do what Marty did and, or wanted to do or Biff really did and like profit over my knowledge of the, <laughs> of the, the future that's going to unfold. Mm -hmm. But I can't say I would really actually do that. Um, Knowing, my, knowing me, I would step on a butterfly and change everything. Yeah. All right, so let's think about Doc Brown as a mad scientist, because by the time we get to 1985 and this movie comes out, uh, Hollywood is saying very different things about mad science. No longer are we making uh, associations between like mad science and Nazis, right? We're not talking about eugenics. Um, but there is a degree of concern that comes with like the idea of like science and scientists. And I really want you to think about like what this movie is saying or these movies are saying like science and scientists should be or need to be, right? Like when we think about like ethics and stuff. Yeah. All right, so let's see it. You're gonna see the other half of uh, that opening scene because I cut it with the clocks and you're gonna see him talk about the DeLorean itself. All right, Doc Brown, uh, I want you to think about what, what we're saying about scientists uh, in terms of like positive and negative, right? Their strengths and their weaknesses. Because often science fiction movies, right? And I'll consider this a science fiction movie because of time travel stuff. But often science fiction movies like can be used to like criticize like current trends in science and things that are going on around the times that are, the film is being produced. Godzilla, there's a, there's a heavy criticism of like American like uh, nuclear development and the research being used and the, the testing. So like what do you think is going on here with Doc Brown? How has the idea of the mad scientist changed? Maybe you think that he's not a mad scientist. I had a very animated conversation with someone about how they believed he wasn't a mad scientist and they were trying to defend that to me. So, I don't know. What do you guys think about the, the science a stuff? Mad scientist, but like not, yeah. not as stereotypical as the normal, like, mad scientist, like, I don't know, kind of, but it's like, so not like, for right. like the same normal goals. Mad. Okay, let's then start with like, what is the stereotypical mad scientist then? Let's like define our term and then we can talk about how Doc Brown is different. 
what do we associate with the mad scientist in general? Hyper-focused. Hyper-focused, right? Yeah. Okay, like so much so that they are not paying attention to other things in their life. Like yeah, Dr. Like Frankenstein's got a... that little machine. Yeah, like turning off the machine when he's not home, right? Uh, Absent-minded, right, uh, almost. Maybe okay. Dangerous. Dangerous? In what, in what regards? Yeah, right, so they're not, mad scientists often, because of their own hubris, I just touched the microphone, because of their own hubris, <laughs> um, they often think they can do no wrong, they, like Icarus, right, they fly too close to the sun, and usually there's, there's potential for disaster. More concerned about if they could and not if they should. Yeah, right, maybe you should have stopped to think about if you should. That's a Jurassic Park reference, I appreciate it. That brings us all the way back to where we were. They're able wow. to get illegal... Um, plutonium, the, uh, illegal plutonium. substances, yeah. like they Ma skirt the law. Mm -hmm. Mad scientists usually are operating outside the bounds of con the conventional legal system, right? Whether you're dig <coughs> digging up dead bodies or robbing power plants of their plutonium, <laughs> there seems to be something there. Did well, you, yeah? Well, they're often outside the bounds of science as well, like science at the time and probably mm -hmm. houses. Yeah. Time yeah. machines aren't a straightforward thing to build into a car. Sometimes like a death laser from the moon is not a thing really you can build. It's always fringe science or pseudoscience right. perhaps. Yeah. Dream dreamers. Dreamers, right? Looking at things differently, wanting more, wanting to push the boundaries. So this all sounds like Doc Brown to me. All right, so what's, what's different about him, or what makes him stand out amongst the huddled crowd of stereotypical mad scientists? Well, so Doc mm. Brown seems very concerned with the people around him. He's yeah, go not, ahead. He's very much not a prime directive guy. At yeah. the end of the movie, he says, it's your kids! Yeah. He goes yeah. off to save <laughs> his friend's family. Even what, do they grow up to be just... assholes or something? Right. Yeah. That's my uh, Michael J. Fox. Uh. Go ahead. Oh. So like, okay. I think he's concerned... In, to some degree with ethics mm -hmm. and some I, I feel like some scientists they sometimes they get to a place like regular scientists they um, their developments <coughs> are beyond they're faster than the ethics can keep up okay so I think that he is ethical to some degree mm -hmm. you know thinking about being yeah. concerned with well, maybe not, because mm. he put the dog in the car. There's a lot of animal testing, like, in these movies. I was thinking about the fly for some reason watching this, the, the Goldblum version. And, um, and I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of animal testing in that. They, they turn, they blow up the, bro the gorilla's brother or whatever. He's like, I'm sorry, I killed your brother. Um, and this, he tested on the dog. So there is some kind of, like, we test these, these dangerous things on animals first. Do do I that. think maybe he just felt that Einstein should prove Einstein wrong. Oh. Good um, notice that the food in the dog bowl looks like poop, and maybe he's pooping on Einstein's theories. I don't know. I don't know if that's a subtle thing or not in the beginning. It sure looks like poop. Yeah. It's not. Go ahead. I believe if we take a look at the lower left hand picture there, Okay. We, can, we can see that after you've been to the future and to the past, mm -hmm. all you have to do is shave your head and you become Uncle Fester. Oh, man. It's, oh, my God. Especially in part three, when, he, when Doc Brown learns the redemptive power of love, uh, I, I see a lot of Uncle Fester in part three. It's like very much that like same awkward... I don't know how to act with women that Just he does look, in Adam's look at the family. Eyebrows. It, it yeah. is. It is. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> Which again, I think he's a great actor. I, 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 I like those Adam's family movies a lot. I think we think people are um, have mental issues uh -huh. until they're proven correct. Ooh, that's like almost word for word from Frankenstein, right? He's like, <laughs> here we stand, three very much sane people, one crazy person. In a couple minutes, we'll see who's right. Uh, but go, yeah, go ahead. But that, but you know, think about what we can do now. We mm -hmm. can do transplants mm -hmm. from people who are deceased. Yeah. And people live. Yeah. So I mean, and well, now we're doing cloning. Mm -hmm. um, Baby Yoda. Go ahead. But, <laughs> <laughs> cloning stem cells. Yeah. All these things are um, controversial. Right. But, um, 
There's a lot of there's a lot of like ethics around these things. And, a lot of should we, even though we can. And Einstein was controversial mm -hmm. until you know he was Someone proven more controversial correct. Controversial came along. Yeah. <laughs> so something to notice about these figures is often they're the, the people who push the boundaries, the people who make the biggest in terms of like technological or ideological breakthroughs are often the people that the majority of society would point to and label as crazy and not want to listen to at all. Right? Somebody who sees that the profit is never appreciated in their time. Right? Someone who sees ahead, right, often has a hard time like in that place. Well, it's it's scary to think outside the box because uh -huh. it's not it's dark out there, the yeah. norm. So, you know, you're also um, com comparing the idyllic 50s, mm -hmm. which all this other stuff was going on in the 50s, yeah. but all they showed was the perfect little house, mm -hmm. the wife, the car, the husband going off to, to work, and the perfect little kids. Yeah. But that's not... Their Davy Crockett that was hap that was there was more happening. Yeah, absolutely. In the 50s than that. Yeah, yeah. So even though we're 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 being, it's not like how Marty thinks it's going to be. It's not how the mother explains it. We are still given a like idealized version of the past with what we see in the 50s. Right. Yes, there are bullies. Yes, they're violent. Yeah, everyone's very rapey. Um, but. But also, right, there's a lot of other things, like Korean War is happening, right? And, like, uh, there, there, there's race issues going on in the country um, that, like, not really a factor, right, in this movie, right? So this movie is only giving you a slice of that. Uh, something I notice is that all of the families gather around the table for dinner in yes. all of the timelines, mm -hmm. but who's the other family member that's a part of all of their meals? It's the television. In all of the scenes with the family around the table, they are watching TV. Um, and that really, those scenes are the most interesting to me because like, I think I've spoke to the art project I'll never do but want to do where I want to go into your house and put like a camera on top of your TV and just like randomly take a picture of all these different people all over the world, right? Like sitting, watching, looking at the camera, right? But they're really looking at the TV. I want to give people like that perspective because we only all experience the other perspective of looking at the screen. I want to show you what you look like when you look at the screen. That's my, that's my plan. If anyone wants to make it happen, contact me on the internet. We'll put it together. Yeah? It's already been done? Damn it. All right, synchronicity. It's okay. I also invented an alarm clock pillow in my mind, only to find out that something like that exists already. Aww. It's okay. Um, it's time travel, man. And yeah. how has that all affected um, people's lives? Yeah. Right? Because, you know, kids in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. played outside. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't really happen, and everything's scheduled, and it's not like you ride down the street and, you know, pick up your friend mm -hmm. and you go ride your bike. Um, it may be like that in some places, sure. but not many. And there could be families today that are like, we're at the dinner table, no, t no TV, put your phones away. There are definitely, I, I believe, are families out there. I think there's a lot more uh, where like, that distraction, that technological presence is there, uh, if not more so. Like I've got students who like, literally need something on in the background, and not even students, I know adults like this, who like, need that, that constant noise. Right, that's some, I'm working on a paper, but I'm listening to music and watching Hulu at the same time. Like, it's fine, like, and it's okay, and it's a skill to multitask, right? But like, it worries me, like, how present that that noise is becoming in our lives, right? The idea, like, uh, you need something on in the background because there's something scary about the silence, silence, maybe. Or maybe it's we don't have enough time, and we're trying to do a no. lot in the time we have. I'm trying to silver lining it. Yeah, what do you think? I think people are, um, it's, it's addictive. Yeah. So it's soothing. Yeah. It's, it, so that if, if you practiced in some quiet, uh -huh. you would probably um, get used to it as a habit like anything else. Uh -huh. But I think that, because I do it myself, you know, when, when you have nothing to do, you think you should be flipping through your phone or you know, your friends are texting you, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it's become a soothing thing. Yeah. 
kind of like a white noise generator. Yeah, like yeah, like that white noise. Don't don't get me wrong. Like that, those frequency things. Like sometimes I'll put that on the background just because like it's it's not the silence, you know, and it's like it's you know, um, but it's like it's weird. Yeah. Like the stuff like white noise, I'm fine with in the background, but I can't concentrate on like what I'm doing if like, there's like a YouTube video or something right. like, in the background. Yeah, like it's yeah. difficult to really pay attention to different things at the same time, right? You can really, it seems like, only put your attention in one yeah. place at one moment. Multitasking is just your brain quickly flipping back and forth between two, multi multiple tasks. You can't like actually focus on multiple things at the same time. It's mm -hmm. just rapidly switching between them. And I think we can see that with Doc Brown. I'm busy steering it back. Um, I think we can see this uh, laser sight focus uh, with Doc Brown. I think we can also see like the addictive nature of technology with how like every solution is just like, all right, let's get in the time machine and go do this. Let's do this. Like, right? they, like more and more, and Doc is becoming more and more okay with like disregarding these like ethical principles that he at least verbally seems to like believe in right don't interact with anyone you'll mess things up you know we can't take uh the his his future wife we can't take her you know it'll change everything it's like all right i guess we're gonna have to take her with us you know like he, he's do, he does constant reversals yeah even if he's disregarding them so much or is like updating his like internal priorities of like what is important mm. he finds that the power of love is more important than the safety of the universe and in in part one that is like the popular song was the power of love uh so perhaps right like maybe it's character growth Right? It's taking our stock character and making him a little more three dimensional, right? Trying to round him out. Totally could be a possibility there. But, um, yes? He, he also is kind of frenetic and all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I think that's about time, too. Yeah. You know, his, his constant movement, his constant, he has to constantly be this. There's no time to figure any of this out. It has to be done now. Okay. And that's kind of how his character behaves. Okay. So I think that's a commentary about time. That's kind of how we are when we go to work. Yeah. You know, we have to be to work. We have to do this. So it's that frenetic mm. okay. um, energy. Yeah, no, definitely. And you see that with uh, the way Christopher Lloyd portrays, like, uh, Doc Brown in terms of, like, his acting choices and stuff. Yeah, absolutely, the mannerisms. And, like, I'm reminded by that lower left gif with it, where it's just like, I know I looped it, but, like, I could actually see him, like, that just being the thing he did in the movie over and over again. Um, okay, he's like, don't talk to your past self, Marty. Make sure you don't run into you from the first movie. And then, like, he goes and has a conversation with him from the first movie. And I'm just like, you just told Marty not to do that. Uh, but again, they like, they a lot of... Contact. They don't make eye contact. And, like, again, first movie, Doc Brown, too focused on what he's doing to even pay attention to who that man is. Um, I think, we, I think mm -hmm. the only reason he's okay with doing that is because he knows that he's not going to realize it because of how invested he how is. How focused he is. Maybe, right? Like, know yeah. thyself, uh, going back to the Matrix. Yeah. The, the, yeah, it's yeah. possible. OK. Anything else? So scientists, in terms of like saying a message about like what we need scientists to be, is that what we're saying? We need our scientists to be focused and OK with like changing their ethics as it goes? Are we saying that we need our scientists to have some kind of like phonetic energy? Are these, is this? Is this a good scientist? I know he invented time travel. Is he a good scientist? Is this what we want our scientists to be? Why or why not? Hey, I have a lot of people. I, I work with a lot of people just like that guy. In my previous Are job. you saying that as a compliment? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, you this could, is a positive thing? Well, yeah, because okay. you, you got to appreciate the eccentricity. OK. And, you know, <laughs> it gave you energy. OK, OK, yeah. So like. Yeah, right? Like, uh, you could feed off of his energy. Maybe yeah. it affects those around him. And, and remember, Doc Brown does make, look, does make Bill Nye look calm. He does make Bill so, Nye look calm. I mean, just... <laughs> Man, I would really like to see Doc Brown have, like, a, like a public access show. <laughs> that would be great. Somebody write that down. There's an idea there. There's an idea there. <laughs> remember, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what that would be. <laughs> OK. You should write this. You want to be Okay. 
Any other well, thoughts? Yes. Professor, I can't tell which. <laughs> I, I think that when, when, like when you're a scientist it. and you're trying to solve a problem, because isn't that mm -hmm. what science is? Science is problem they solving. They try to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So their goal is to solve the problem. It's, it's, you know, the other stuff comes after the problem solved. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, okay. Sometimes solving one problem creates other so not, problems. Yeah. And we see that in this movie, but yeah. they are able to more or less fix all of the problems that they create. Yeah. Marty's yeah. life is still very different by the end of part three. He has no actual memory of his life in this timeline that exists. But I imagine it would be okay for him. He's got a nice car. His yeah. parents are doing well. Who cares? Mom's drinking problem has been fixed. Dad is a successful writer. And we can salvage all the parts of the DeLorean. Yeah, it's okay, I mean, there we are. We're good. We, it's fine. We'll melt that down. Okay. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Where did he get his money? He, it's his family's money, I believe. Oh, I could never um, Because it's the Brown Mansion, and they came over as the Von Brauns, and during the war, they changed it to the Browns. Does anybody have any more insight to where the money comes from? Well, he had family money. That's what I thought, yeah. Because in the beginning, he said it took me 30 years and my entire family yes. fortune. Mm -hmm. Because you'll notice that one scene in the second movie, I think, or maybe it's the first movie, mm -hmm. where he goes to Doc Brown's house, and it's, it's a much garage. nicer house. Oh, than yes, that's house. in the first movie when he goes yeah. back to the 50s. Yeah, it's a much nicer house than, he see, than you see in the beginning of that yeah. movie. There is a newspaper clipping in the beginning that gives you like exposition that the mansion, that nice house, had burned down. Yeah. Um, you also see that like the freeway came to town. There's yeah. like the freeway, and his garage is like out of place in the area that it's in. Yep. So you get the chance that he was like fighting progress. He was like fighting that stuff coming in. I don't know. Maybe foul play was involved with the mansion burning down. Maybe it was his uh, eccentricity. Uh, maybe it was an experiment gone maybe wrong. Maybe it was an experiment gone wrong, yeah. right? So there's a lot of inferences we can make based off of that stuff. <laughs> All right, let's talk about human ingenuity. Uh, yeah, we're doing good on time. OK. Um, so problem solving is really important in this film. I would say the movie is primarily about like humans' ability to <clears throat> fix the problems we create or even the ones we don't create. So I'm going to show you two examples of that question mark. I don't remember. In, in my, yes, and in my notes, uh, it was, I wrote something like, it's about like if you're an asshole, you'll get shit on or something like that. And I was like, there's some message here with that. Because you're like, these bullies like are constant, or Biff specifically, right? The Menorah joke comes up in all three movies. You make your movies. own shit. Yeah, yeah, kind of, right? Yeah, you create that stuff. Um, yeah, there's definitely this idea about like uh, standing up to bullies, right? That's something in all three of the movies. Um, all right, so let's think about problem solving. So there's a lot of problem solving in these movies. I specifically pick those three scenes to show you right now because in each of those scenes, right, like technology is still involved in the, the human ingenuity, the problem solving, right? They're aided by the availability of other technology. But let's think about like what this movie could be saying in terms of like the power of an individual, right? Like especially when we're thinking about like the forces of destiny and time and all that. But like, what is it showing us about like ourselves? You know, like uh, our own abilities. What do you think? We create our own problems. Mm, how so? Um, you wouldn't be getting into these issues if you didn't open Pandora's box from the get-go. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're the reason why most of the science that we have currently exists uh -huh. or is being worked upon is because of the issues that we've created ourselves. Oh, okay, that's interesting, right? Like a lot of, uh, like, um, like pollution, right? We develop technology, we create a lot of pollution, now we're developing new technology to help like combat the problem of pollution and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, I could see that, um, especially since you think about Marty's situation in that last clip I showed you from the third movie, right? Like, he did create that problem, right? Because he can't uh, back down from a challenge, right? Like, he's, he's in that situation, right? It's too late at this point to avoid it. So that's something to think about as well, right? Like a lot of 
you you made your bed now lie in it, right? That kind of thing. Like you, you design your own like uh, hell in a lot of ways. Okay. Other thoughts about it? Well, however, he also, when you get to the end of the third movie, he doesn't take the dare mm -hmm. and do the drag race. So he learned from the early exper earlier experience. Mm -hmm. And because he didn't do that, he didn't hit the Rolls Royce that causes the problem right. in the, the, the second movie. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so, tangent, but let's go there for a second. Like, um, do you, I feel like... Marty's arc in the first movie means nothing in the second and third movies. His arc in the first movie is being about is being afraid to try, right? Like with his band, you know, but what if they don't laugh at me or what if they don't think, right? Like and he overcomes that by helping coach his father because the father says the same thing. And in the second and third movie all of a sudden it's the chicken thing and Marty needing to learn to like back down when in the first movie which literally happens seconds before the second and third movie um like it's it's the opposite. So I like what do you guys think about that? Is it just me that I think that's weird? Do you think there's like a bigger point I'm missing with no, it? Or do you think they're problem. connected? Yeah. It's they thought they thought it would be more interesting if he would if he like got like if he couldn't be cult like afraid rather than Okay. Like, it, they thought it would be better like interest like story wise, like to make the movie interesting. Yeah, characters with inner conflicts and some kind of character arc, yeah, do make for, for better characters, absolutely. And that's why they try to give Doc a love life in the third movie, right? Because like giving him another dimension makes him a more realistic person instead of just a cartoon. Um, but what else do you think about it? Because I saw a couple hands. Think they're connected, you think it's a... We ran out of ideas for Marty. Could there have been an extension of that first thing that played out instead that might have been a better choice? I said it was unrelated, but this has been bothering me. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that he, you know, in the scene with the Coke bottle, mm -hmm. I think um, he, he kind of saw uh, some of the ingenuities that he had as better than the time mm. he was in. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, he couldn't operate any other way unless someone there showed him how. Right, because he's probably used to the twist off. Yes, right? and, and, and then, you know, the person who lives in the time is just like, you know, you just put it in here and the yeah. cap comes off. So sometimes we think that uh, technology is better, mm -hmm. but it's not always better because sometimes it <clears throat> creates its own problems. Yeah, because consider this, one of the themes that seems to be running through not just these three movies, but like a lot of the movies we've talked about, is often the problems are solved using older technology, right? Independence Day, they're able to communicate this worldwide strike using Morse, co Morse, co Morse code. Um, in this, they put transistors and tubes on the DeLorean and ultimately end up with steam as the power source, which again is like, we're talking about something that's coming before gasoline and nuclear power and all this other stuff. So like that's important to consider as well, that often like this newer stuff is the stuff that's unreliable and it's the older technology that, that's been tried and tested and perfected in a lot of ways. Can improve on perfection maybe? Well, I don't know. You use, yeah. They had to use their brain. Yeah. They couldn't use a technology that was already created for them mm -hmm. that would solve whatever problem they had. They had to use their brains to solve the problem that was in front of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that human ingenuity. And for, for as far as I'm concerned, that's what still separates us from the robots that are going to take over, right? The fact that we can think outside our programming. We can uh, ad lib and um, innovate and experiment and they can't yet, right? And when they do, we should let them vote. But they, that's, my, that's my advice. But yeah. they do, but technology does seem intuitive mm -hmm. because once they get to know you, mm -hmm. they can pretty much hand you what you think you need. Okay. All right, fair enough. Is it something about the answers sort of already exist within the realm that you're living in and you don't have to go searching beyond, Maybe. you know, look at that as a character arc or in so many films, 
somebody has to overcome something, but they do it not by an external resource, but mm -hmm. internally. Yeah, the you answer know, was inside you all yeah. along, the right? The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz, I was just thinking <laughs> about it. Right, right? It's true, it's true you, Tin Man, it's yeah. true. <laughs> you had the power all along. Um, yeah, perhaps, right? Like, that. the answers are right in front of us. The answers lie with ourselves. We're the only ones who are going to be able to fix the problems we create. It's not going to be something that we're going to find by looking back to the past or ahead to the future. Right? It can be solved today and now if we just maybe change the way we look at things, Matter perhaps. Matter perspective, to yeah. your point before about time being all perspective-based. Yeah, yeah, right? And like, I think that's, that's really valid here, right? This idea of perspective, I think, is important. Okay, uh, with the sake of time, because we've got 11 minutes. Oh. Yes. oh, man, I guess I'll show you, Johnny, be good. Uh, all right, Johnny, be good. Uh, we got to talk about nostalgia. I got to time. Shoes, I got to time these yeah, better. Right? <laughs> all right, here we go. I'm gonna show this clip. And three, two, one. So uh, things about nostalgia, and I'm gonna try not to shortchange this, but I'm also gonna think about how to better pace things in the future. Um, nostalgia is that like longing for the past, the uh, like the idea that things were better back there. Right, and like if you think about the time this movie's made, right, um, culturally there is a conversation that's asking to return to like former values and stuff like that. And you think about like where we are as a culture today, there is a, again that same kind of mindset where it's like things were better back then, we need to return to these good old days. And there's something very like problematic about that. And this movie, movies in a lot of ways, try to try to really show you the problems of nostalgia. Um, and a lot of my big problem with like the third movie specifically is like the version of the Wild West they go to. Because you can say that the 50s we get is like a Hollywood version of the 1950s, a nostalgic version, but it's still got some issues and things to it, some grit to it. I really think the Wild West that we go back to in the third one is just like Hollywood's Wild West, right? Like as seen in the 50s. And I guess like maybe that's the point because Doc dresses him like, like that. But like that's my problem with the third movie and the Wild West that they show us because it's like too similar to the Wild West of of Hollywood cinema in my mind, whereas the 50s in this movie maybe was a little different from like 50s I'd seen in Hollywood, but I don't know. Um, with that said, right, like what is dangerous about nostalgia? What warnings about like being too invested in the way things used to be, right, could we see maybe in this film? And how could we maybe apply that to our own lives? Well, yeah. It comes down to perspective. Sure, the that's our word for the night. Good things were good for some people, but not for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they might have been good for you, but not for your neighbor. Sure, yeah. And that's important to consider, absolutely. Other thoughts with it? Yeah. I don't know. There's something just wonderful about watching the shark sequence run again and again mm -hmm. and seeing those Beanie and Cecil button eyes on the shark. Yeah. That really does it for me and brings me right back to the early 60s. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that tells me a lot. Uh, <laughs> None of it could. <laughs> but it's like, Absolutely. but think about even the example of that shark, the idea that like Jaws will still be important then, right? We're up to what, Jaws 19 by that point? Yeah. Right, and like we do live in an age now where like you're not gonna get intele uh, like original intellectual property like financed in mainstream Hollywood. It's really difficult to sell something that isn't a pre-existing idea. <laughs> All right, like because like we know that that has been tested and will sell, and like again, like you look at a lot of remakes and soft reboots that come out that don't do well. Right, it's even like that. That's not true either. But that's like one of the dangers of nostalgia. Yeah, right. That like, well, you've seen the Ghostbusters, so here's another Ghostbuster movie. You've no, seen. It's not. Right. <laughs> right. Like you've seen. I don't know, what's a, you've seen Star Wars. Here's some more Star Wars, guys. It's a Star Wars. But you've seen Casino Royale. Right. Twice. Twice now, <laughs> that's true. Once was on television though, it's I think, right? It's like a money thing, because it's like, yeah. well, like with Star Wars, it's like, uh, it has a huge fan base, and like, you can probably put out as many stuff mm. as you want, and you can get as much criticism, but it'll still make the same amount of money. Which is very wise. it's a huge franchise. Mm -hmm. Because what nostalgia really is, ladies and gentlemen, is a commercial. Nostalgia is trying to sell you on a lie. And the Back to the Future trilogy are a 
bunch of commercials, right? And like, just look for the product placement, and Pepsi. like, it's it becomes AT &T. really clear. <laughs> Pepsi, AT and T, like it's everywhere. Like Back to the Future is, uh, in a lot of ways, like Hollywood starting to commercialize their movies. A lot of this like sponsored content is being like put into all the scenes, um, and it's selling you a, a lie about the past. Even though the movie is like trying to show you the lies about the past, yeah. It's like most commercials. It mm -hmm. it, it it takes you out of reality, mm -hmm. so you don't have to deal with reality because you're living in nostalgia, mm -hmm. or you're living in some idea that you have about how society should be to for you, and not what society is for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think that's so yeah. much of what you said. I like that. I think that's a, those are really good things to to bring up, and I'm like I like that I was able to like make the connection of like nostalgia and commercials because that wasn't like something I prepared. It's like as you're saying that, I'm like, oh wow, yeah, that's what this is. Like it's it's a bunch of commercials. So I mean, I haven't thought it through. I'll think it through more, but like I see it there. Final thoughts? Yes. And now you have branded. You not only have branded commercial items, you yeah. have branded people. Yeah. Yeah. You know so they don't even have to be themselves. They can be a brand of mm -hmm. themselves. All the world's a stage, you yes. know what I mean? Yeah. We are all characters. Yeah. Hmm. Shakespeare's like this movie. Uh, Macbeth. But that's a, uh, I'll get tangent. All right, final thoughts, anyone else? <laughs> well, because Macbeth is totally propaganda for King James the First, right? It is, because it's a falsified history and everything else. But also Shakespeare in Macbeth is trying to draw your attention to the fact that this play is propaganda. So I think something similar is going yeah, on in Back to the Future. It. With oh, it, like, it is very much poking fun at how this movie is being used to manipulate you. Um, maybe. Not the yeah, third one, the though. Yeah, because the product placement is like, very in your face, mm -hmm. where I feel like in other movies, it's like softly in the background. Yeah. But like at t shows up on the screen, and yeah. it's like, hey, this is brought to you by at t and there's like the big JCPenney in the back, and it's like so big in your yeah. face. And there, there's no attempt to hide it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, but anything else? Nothing yeah. else to do with the movie either. Nothing, no, nothing, right. nothing to do. Pizza Hut, Jay-Z Pennies, they have no bearing on it. You could have shot that scene anywhere. You know, I, now I'm hearing everybody talk. <laughs> that's the danger, and I think that's the place we're in, yeah. is because the, the corporations are directing policy uh -huh. and directing how, how we live in society and how we care for each other mm -hmm. is directed by, the, by corporations. Yeah. Yeah, like a lot of uh, like our values, our morals as a culture, as a society, right? Like are projected to us just as much as they are. Like in movies, they are reflected, and we can see ourselves in these movies, right? These movies, TV shows, commercials, video games, like they put ideas out there too, right? And it's largely like big money corporations with with their own interests, right? Trying to sell a product, who are now shaping those those messages. Right, we're not talking about movies as like high art, we're talking about this commercials for the Super Bowl. Right? I think that's like kind of what we're starting to see happen at this point in, in cinema by the mid eighties. All right. I like it. Uh, we're flashing the thirty second warning. There's my there's my awkward photo of Marty and his mom. Uh, <laughs> With that being said, it is donation season, and LMC is a non-for-profit organization, and I would like to encourage all of our viewers at home in Italy, uh, India, <laughs> France, wherever you're watching around the, the globe, right? A content like this, uh, free thought and free speech could not exist without your own generosity. So while you are watching commercials and buying the latest smartphones, I'd like you to remember that, you know, this is a good time to, to donate to organizations who are, you know, supporting our own human ingenuity. So, you know, please visit lmctv.org uh, and donate if you can. You guys donate twice. Um, <laughs> with that said, tentatively, January 10th, which is the second Friday in January, I'll give you, I'll give you a holiday break. Um, January 10th, uh, let's, let's continue this, this erosion of, of my happiness and let's really think about how uh, money and commercials uh, are influencing us, uh, and let's get mad as hell and not take it anymore. Oh, ooh, um, yes. So next month we'll watch Network 1976. Uh, Please. Hope to see you there. Thank you and good night. Yay. But are we mad as hell? 
I'm mad as hell, always. Clap for each other, right? Let's clap for each other. Thank you.